Um, two quick items. Um, as with the other panels, you can ask questions afterwards. We'll be passing the cards around. Uh, feel free to uh, post on social media with uh, hashtag grassroots2019. And just um, wanted to bring up uh, one other um, item. There was a lot of uh, um, leftover food. I want you to know that that's been donated to a local um, homeless shelter, so that's not going to go to waste. Yeah. Our dis uh, distinguished panelists will be discussing the various threats and issues to Artsakh and what the grassroots can do to organize and advocate on its behalf. Artsakh, be, despite its beauty, promise, and potential for growth, is constantly at risk to Azerbaijani and Turkish hostility. Activism in the United States and in the diaspora is vital to its survival. I'd like to introduce both the moderator and panelist. Simon Maakyan is a Denver-based political analyst who organizes Armenian American communities and whose decade-long research has recently exposed the greatest cultural genocide of our time. As ANCA Western Region's Community Development Coordinator, Simon has been organizing grassroots activism in the 18 states since January 2015. In addition to his part-time ANCA employment, he lectures in international relations at the University of Colorado, Denver. Previously, from 2006 to 2014, he worked at Colorado's legislature as a nonpartisan staffer. Concurrently, he served as South Caucus Specialist for Amnesty International USA. USA. Over the past decade, he has documented and publicized Azerbaijan's 1997 to 2006 destruction of Nakhichevan's Armenian heritage, which culminated in February in the February 2019 publication of what the Guardian's monumental loss, Azerbaijan and the worst cultural genocide of the 21st century, reviewed, praised as a rock solid investigation. So I'd like to invite our moderator and uh, panelist, as well as um, I'll invite up, or do you wanna go ahead and introduce as they come up? Okay. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, everyone, for being here today on this important day as ANCA brings together activists, academics, and leaders of the Armenian community and our friends to discuss issues of importance to our homeland and our communities. As Becky mentioned, today we will talk about Artsakh, one of the twin states of the Armenian homeland, which, as we all know, faces existential threats from neighboring Azerbaijan. The claims Artsakh, the de facto Armenian Republic, as its sovereign territory and threatens to take it with force. Today, our panel will look at the challenges facing Artsakh, and we will look at it from three different perspectives. First, I'll talk about another formerly Armenian region, Nakhijevan, the fate of which Artsakh has sought to avoid. Then, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Artsakh will share a brief background on her country and its current challenges. And lastly, we will hear about the demining efforts that despite substantial success are still needed, needed to make Artsakh a safer place for all of its citizens and visitors. Now I'd like to introduce the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Republic of Artsakh Armine Alexanian. She has been the Deputy Minister since July 2015. She was born in Martuni, Artsakh, studied English and German at Artsakh State University, followed by studies at London's Westminster University, 
where she studied political theory and international relations. She subsequently received a master's degree in diplomatic studies in 1999 from the Diplomatic Academy of London, Westminster University. In 1995 to 1996, she worked in the formerly called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, now Artsakh Republic government, as an assistant and interpreter to the prime minister. In January 2000, she started to work for the Artsakh Foreign Ministry while also teaching at the State University. Please help me welcome the Honorable Armine Alexanian. <laughs> Armine, since I will be talking uh, briefly about my research, would you like to give us a short preview of what you'll be talking about next? Good day, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the organizers of this conference for this opportunity, which will, I hope, allow us to share the challenges and find solutions together to the issues that are of all Armenian importance uh, that collide in Artsakh. And also, I would like to use this opportunity to thank ANC International for their recent conference we have organized in Artsakh partnering with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Artsakh that brought called Pro-Artsakh Conference, which gathered all the friends of Artsakh from different states, from different countries, and allowed us to actually elaborate on the problems that we're going to talk today. And um, I'll be happy to share with you um, all this information and answer the questions you may have. Thank you. We also have the privilege of being joined with B B Amasya Zarkadian, who is the Grants and Development Manager for the U.S. branch of the HALO Trust, the world's largest humanitarian mine clearance organization. Since 2000, HALO has been the only agency clearing the minefields and cluster munition strikes in Artsakh, having cleared about 500 minefields and destroyed nearly 12,000 mines and over 60,000 other explosive remnants of war. He recently returned to Washington, D.C. after spending two years in Stepanagert, Artsakh, as HALO's regional program officer for the Caucasus, covering Karabakh, Georgia, and Abkhazia. A Tehran-born Angelino, did I say it right? I'm from Denver, so. It's called Denverite. Um, Amasya is a graduate of Stanford University, where he received his BA and MA degrees. Please help me welcome Amasya Zarkarian. <laughs> Amasya, if you could give us a short preview of what your presentation will be about. Sure. Thank you, Simon. And again, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the ANCA for all your efforts, not just for having us here, but for everything that you've made possible um, over the last however many decades. Um, I also just came back from, from Artsakh just a few days ago, so I'm, I'm fresh. I'm, I'm excited to talk, to talk about this. Um, I was there because we had the privilege of hosting three members of the U.S. Congress, um, as well as a number of people who participated in the, in the pro-Artsakh forum, legislators from different U.S. states, from different countries, um, which was an unprecedented amount of, of uh, attention from elected officials. Um, it was a privilege to do that. Um, as Simon mentioned, I'm going to talk about the ongoing campaign to rid Artsakh of, of landmines and other um, explosive remnants of war, but I'm going to try to place it in, in, a, in a wider context. So how is what is going on in, in Gharabakh part of a global effort to get rid of landmines? Um, and second, how is that significant for Armenian Americans, or rather, how are Armenian Americans significant for what we're trying to do in Karabakh? Thank you so much, Amasya. So we'll get started. Let's give both Amasya and Armenia a great round of applause. And so I will talk about my research that I've done over the past decade or more into Azerbaijan's erasure of the entire medieval Armenian heritage in Nakhijevan. The title may sound sensational, but wait, 
until the end of the presentation. There is nothing sensational except the actual crime and the cover-up that they did in this land, in this former part of the Armenian homeland, which is exactly, as I mentioned earlier, what, um, what Artsakh has tried to avoid. And as I talk about my journey into investigating this destruction, let's go to 2013, to North Iran. Here's the border with Azerbaijan, with Nakhijevan. Across the border where that flat field is, the view was supposed to be magical. I know it because my father visited there. Back then, it was the Soviet Union's southwestern edge. My father was not allowed to take photographs, but others before and after have. There, you had thousands of sacred burial monuments, khachkars. They depicted biblical scenes, medieval life, and the mystical double-bodied sphinx. Beneath rested visionary merchants whose lasting legacies include Europe's first cafes and Captain Kidd's pirated loot. This was Julfa, the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery. At its height, there were 10,000 Khachkars. By the 1980s, 3,000 remained, yet it still was the largest field of cross stones in the world. I was 19 in December 2005 when I heard of the destruction of Julfa. An Armenian priest in North Iran had gone to the border and videotaped 200 soldiers of Azerbaijan smashing the remaining stones with sledgehammers, dumping it into the river Araxas. Within weeks, centuries of history was erased because it looked so awkward to have freshly flattened earth on an international border which is not suited for anything they had to create this temporary rifle range to rationalize their actions. But when I went there in 2013, it was no longer there. I was horrified. I was upset that Armenia's response was timid, that Azerbaijan was denying it, and worse so, that the world was doing nothing. So this became my cause. Within a year, with help from a lot of people, especially a young student by the name of Sarah Pickman, we produced a documentary called The New Tears of Our Access. Actually, Adam Hampadian sitting right here had sent me the CD with the footage of the destruction after which I connected with the pre priest and got further, uh, further permission to use it. Then I published an article I'd written in under undergraduate school. Um, my professor was Glenn Morris, famous from the militant American Indian movement. And he was like, why don't you submit this to you know, a large paper? I said, well, I'm in my early 20s. I'm not a scholar. But apparently, you don't have to mention those things. And so I published the article in 2007 in the world's uh, leading historical magazine, History Today. The next thing, again, with a lot of help from people, was creating the website, julfa.com, that brought together all of the information on the destruction of the world's largest field of cross stones or khachkars. The next big project was convincing the American Association for the Advancement of Science to use satellite imagery to prove that the cemetery had indeed disappeared because Azerbaijan kept denying all efforts of talking about this. They had organized a, a press conference when the website was launched. They always gave the country of Armenia the credit for all this work. Um, I guess that's a compliment to the Armenian government. Um, and so the satellite imagery came out. It was a lot of lobbying to be done because until this, the only satellite comparisons that had been done were for human uh, rights violations that directly targeted civilian populations. This became popular during and the aftermath of the Darfur genocide. And this was the first investigation ever into cultural destruction, which unfortunately became uh, a, a, a very common practice when ISIS started targeting monuments in Syria and in Iraq. Then I 
organized this petition. Many of you probably signed it to UNESCO, asking them to act. Little, little did I know then that the UNESCO secretary, uh, director generals rather, were both on the payroll of Azerbaijan. And I welcome them to, to sue me for saying this um, because I can prove that they were. That didn't help. And so I launched the Facebook page. And then I wanted to do something positive, something lasting, something that actually created something instead of talking about destruction. So I convinced the Armenian community in Colorado to do something crazy, and that's to build the first ever Armenian cross stone on the grounds of any state capital in this country. And so we rebuilt, after four years of work with Armenians of Colorado, one of the Julfa cross stones that had been destroyed. Thank you. And that's exactly what I thought. I was like, yay, mission accomplished. I am done now to you know, move on to my own life, start a family, buy a townhouse, start a small real estate business so I can pay down my debt. And so I got engaged with my now wife, Angela, on January 1st, 2018. And I thought all of this was behind me. Five days later was Armenian Christmas, and I couldn't fall asleep. I had neglected to tell the full story of Julfa. It's as if you talked about the Armenian genocide and you only talked about Derzor. Or if you wanted to talk about the Holocaust but you only talked about Auschwitz. Julfa was not an isolation. It was a tiny part, even though it was the grand finale, but a small part of a huge crime against humanity. This was worse than ISIS. How come the world ignored this? How come Azerbaijan got away with this? And if I did not tell the story, who would? And would I ever forgive myself if the world never learned of the greatest cultural genocide of our time? So these were my thoughts on uh, the Armenian Christmas, and I had to do something about this for my own conscience. You know, this is not charity work, even though I never got paid for this or any of the people who helped me. This is, you know, to be able to sleep well at night. And so I had to put together the best team possible because we only had one shot to tell the story. And my co-author, Sarah Pickman, who was a student when we made the video together, is now a PhD candidate in history at Yale. We recruited reviewers, including an anonymous Azerbaijani historian who also served as an eyewitness. He saw the destruction. And many, many contributors, not just for the research, but throughout the years, 13 months later, after hundreds of sleepless nights, the article came out on February 18, 2019. A regime conceals its erasure of indigenous Armenian culture. This was actually supposed to be published in history today. We had worked with them for an entire year. They backed out, never told us what the reason was, but we're glad it got published in the US because our editor intends to submit this for a Pulitzer for international reporting. Had it been published in London, we would not qualify for that. <laughs> Here are the Armenian sites that existed in Nakhijevan. Julfa is on the lower left corner, but look at the rest of them. When you think about this destruction, don't just think of Julfa. It's not just Derzor. It was all over the land. And here are the sources. So we use eyewitness testimony. On the top left, we have Argam Ayvazian, the hero who spent decades documenting the Armenian monuments of Nakhijevan during the Soviet era. He himself was born there. He felt that this was going to end one day because all of his family and friends, including himself, had been forced to leave Nakhijevan. No Armenian stayed there, and he thought the same would happen to the monuments. The next person is Father or Bishop Nishan Topuzian, who witnessed the destruction. I was also an eyewitness to what had remained. In fact, I'm standing in the foreground of a Julfa chapel bed on Iran's territory, which Iran has repaired since. We have, with the backdrop of the mountain in Agulis, the famous Azerbaijani novelist Akram Aylisli, also a witness to this destruction. You probably heard of his book, Stone Dreams. That book is not a novel. That book is not about massacres. That book documents the Armenian history of Agulis and its eight churches, which he loved and worshipped as a Muslim Azerbaijani. He saw it as part of his heritage. 
Then we have Stephen Sim. You heard about him earlier today, the man who traveled throughout Turkey to document what had been left. He sneaked to, into Nakhichevan for a few days, and there was nothing left. There are not even ruins. There's not even dust. We have the anonymous Azerbaijani historian looking really good in the photo. Really, really good person. And then Shura Burtin, who is a Russian, independent Russian journalist who went in 2013. We also use the archival documents from Azerbaijan. The first one is from 1997. Akram Ailisti, the novelist with the mountain, back, uh, with the mountain background, he sent a telegram to Haydar Aliyev, the president at the time in Azerbaijan, on June 10th, 1997, telling him, I've heard, he actually witnessed, but he said, I've heard that the destruction of Armenian churches and cemeteries of Agulis has started. Please stop this evil vandalism. Of course, it did not. It continued. Julfa was targeted for a while, but because of Armenian protests and the visible location on the Iranian border, the destruction did not finish until December of 2005. That was days after the order in the center by Vasif Talibov, the leader of Nahi Javan, was signed. And that uh, order basically said, make a passport documentation of everything that is in Nahi Javan to prove that this is the land of Azerbaijani Turks. We know what that meant. And actually, they admitted to it to, in the encyclopedia, which is the one to the right, in which they summarized the findings of the investigation. So two years of final destruction. And in there, they say Armenians demonstrating hostility uh, against us. And I'm not going to mock the, the, the English there, have not only lent claim against us, but also uh, our monuments. And so the last part says, the health investigations once again prove that the land belonged to the Azerbaijani Turks and that the historical and cultural monuments left from our forefathers for us are the seal of Azerbaijanis over this land. And so to summarize, the 89 medieval churches that Argam Ayvazian had documented, the 5,840 cross stones, half of which were at Julfa, and 22,000 flat tombstones, many of them ornate and with incredible <laughs> engraving information about the people who had passed, all of those by 2007, they were reduced to zero. It is not out of question that there might be a few graves from the 20th century of Armenians in Nahi Javan. But the idea is not because the Azerbaijani government completely hates Armenians, they hate our history more. And so they destroyed everything that was older than the 19th century. Here's an example of one of the 89 churches, Surp Karapet, holy precursor of Abrakunis, today called Ebrekunus. And it's a church that was rebuilt several times and most prominently in the 14th <coughs> century by someone named Malakia Grimetsi, uh, Malakia of Crimea. And when Stephen Sim visited in August 2005, this is what was remained of it. And actually, here's a photograph of the unveiling of the mosque that took place there in 2013. Just so you realize, this was done completely by the national government. On the very left, we have the leader of Azerbaijan's Muslim clerics who had traveled from Baku for this. And he does anything and everything that the Aliyevs tell him to. Next to him is Vasif Talibov, <clears throat> the leader of Nahi Javan, who is also related to the Aliyevs and does anything and everything that he is told to do. Here's the same church and a photograph done by an anonymous photographer showing the mosque. Now, to be clear, this is not a religious issue. Most of the churches had not been replaced with mosques. This is to erase the Armenian history, which happened to be Christian. Another church, another photograph by Stephen Sim and Arga Maivazian earlier. This is actually Tsarna. Those of you who know the history of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, who was born in Tsarna? Which founder? Rostom. So this is the birthplace of Rostom and also the birthplace of Gomidas' own ancestors. So even though we think of Gomidas as Western Armenian, his roots are in Eastern Armenia, in Nahijevan, in Gokhtan, in Tsarna. So here's a church and a photograph 
uh, that shows the, the landmarks and a social media photograph that shows the same landmarks, but no signs of the church. Agulis was that famous town that Akram Ailisi wrote about. At one point it had 12 churches. Until the breakup of the Soviet Union, it had eight churches. Here's an overlay of where they were. One of them was particularly famous. Even Azerbaijani publications like this one, earlier from the 20th century, showcased, it, showcased the churches. Here are the inside and the outside. On the right side, you have an inscription that tells the history of the church or the tradition the people believed in. And that was Bartholomew the Apostle came to Armenia to preach Christianity. His co-disciple Thomas went, went to India, and there he was martyred. So a chapel was established by Bartholomew for St. Thomas, which became a church, later a cathedral. That's why this was called St. Thomas. Here is the interior and the exterior. Um, Ar Argam Ivazian had to be very careful to get inside the church, so he actually took a local Armenian, one of the last living Armenians in Nakhijavan with him, and she told the local Azerbaijanis that Argam Ivazian had a health problem, something was wrong with his brain, and he believed that only by spending time inside the cathedral he could figure out you know, the problem and get cured. So they let him in, they closed the door. He actually told me, I did not write about this, he told us that he chased a chicken around the church to show that he was really crazy. I guess you gotta be crazy to spend your entire life documenting monuments. Here is another view of Agulis with the church, St. Thomas. I actually have found a social media photo with an overlay of what it looks like today another mosque has replaced it. Here is actually the unveiling of the mosque. Can you spot Vasif Talibov? Or as my Azerbaijani colleague, who I cannot name, calls him Vasif Talibanov. Here's the guy in the center. He is a dictator. Nakhijevan is much worse than Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is already one of the worst dictatorships in the world. And he does everything that the Ali has tell him to. Here's a photo when he had gotten the job just a few years later. Can you count the number of Haydar Aliyev photos in the room? This was a president at the time, now his son is in charge. Any guesses? I counted six. Someone said there's got to be a few in this pocket too, but we can't see it. There's one publication in Nahi Javan, the official news that comes out from the government, and they obviously took a note of the investigation that was published, and their response was all over the board, just calling it a bunch of names, insults, which I took as compliments because there was nothing else they could say. Only two factual claims they made was one, we did not use the official names of the geographic locations. Who cares? We actually, we actually did use the official names in the captions, but you know that does not talk to the actual facts of the destruction. And they said that somehow those monuments had been taken out of Nakhijevan beforehand by Armenians. So good job all of you taking out 28,000 monuments out of Nakhijevan. Actually 20 <coughs> cross stones from Julfa have been taken out in the Soviet era and thank, we're, we're very thankful to the people who did. The international media reacted. Of course, the Armenian media, this was big news there. I interviewed with pretty much every Armenian network. The Armenian diaspora took a note of the investigation. Uh, newspapers in England, China, France, Germany, Italy were also interested. Not so much in the US, but we're very fortunate to be joined by a reporter from the LA Times today who's here to cover this investigation. And finally, last but not least, the big investigation, the big review that The Guardian did about this work. And this is actually what allowed me to use the word, the phrase, worst or greatest cultural genocide of our time. I was not too comfortable with that phrase, um, but I did mention it during my interview because it meets all the criteria. Of course, Genocide does not have a cultural component under the current international law, but the person who championed it, Raphael Lemkin, did advocate for it. It was not included, even though he had actually classified it as crimes of vandalism along with crimes of barbarism, which was the first time he articulated the genocide crime in 1933. So this allowed me to use this term and not feel like I'm sensational, uh, you know, it's a sensation, but a few weeks ago, I rewatched the tapes from the destruction of Julfa, 
and I realized that I was not the first one to use it. In the destruction tape, Father Nishan Topuzian actually uses the same phrase, the greatest cultural genocide of our time. And he also told me something in his last email, which was, if we don't keep speaking about this destruction in 10 years, it will be forgotten history. He died a few months after that from a heart attack at age 44. So when I went to Iran in 2013, he was not there to join me for tea at the chai khana or the tea house next to Julfa. But you're all here today. So I ask you to speak up and join me in telling the world about the greatest cultural genocide of our time. Thank you. So I realize you maybe could not hear me too well before. You could? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to ask the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Republic of Artsakh to brief us on her country. Okay. Shall I this one there? Either way. Okay. We'll I decided that I'm not going to give you any background information on Artsakh because I assume as ANCA activists you are more or less aware of what is the situation in Artsakh. I will say in general terms, um, I, I want to concentrate more on activism and how we can join forces to actually reach the desired goals. Artsakh is a place that, is, that has got independence. It has been so for 20 seven and more years, but to this day it is not recognized. Apart from not being recognized, its population is under constant threat of physical extermination from neighboring Azerbaijan. And added to, to that is also the fact that Artsakh is being isolated from Azerbaijan and it tries to do it on every sphere of life. And I, want, I think that everyone now understands why it is important to actually have Artsakh on the agenda, on the priority agenda of all the grassroots organizations working in the diaspora. Because if we don't, um, we'll lose the game. Not only the game, but we'll lose the homeland. If we don't, Artsakh could become Nahijevan. Because as we talked about it, I wouldn't really like to stand here one day or hear someone else standing here and talking about Artsakh in a past tense. So for this, we really have to wake up and try to make sure that we do our best to join our efforts to make Artsakh a place that develops, that gets sustainable development in all spheres of lives. And when I say sustainable development, I'm not excluding the philanthropy as such, because we should not forget that philanthropy has brought us to the place where we can now do sustainable, where we can ensure sustainability. And in some spheres of life, philanthropy is still needed. Um, let's take the field of economy, for example. The fact that it is not recognized and we cannot have official ties with other countries, the only route we have with the outside world is through Armenia and through diaspora efforts. And of course, diaspora has more possibilities in a sense because diaspora being the citizens of the given country, they have certain amount of influence and they can actually do more in connecting with the uh, leadership of their country. Economic wise, I think it's important to realize that Artsakh today, what, needs, what Artsakh needs today is not actually to be given the fish, but to be given the means to actually do the fishing itself, to do something that will ensure that it can develop and become stronger. And in that sense, there are different spheres of economy that I can give you an example. For example, 10 years ago, none of us could imagine that when we were cut off from electricity in one single day, 
None of us could imagine that we could actually be self-sufficient on energy resources. We are, and we're not only self-sufficient, but actually starting 2018, Artsakh is exporting electrical in energy. So we really have to make sure that we can say this about other spheres of life in Artsakh. It could be housing. We could help to invest in housing and make sure that it is a mutually beneficial project. It doesn't necessarily have to include a recipient and a benefactor. It could be a mutually business-oriented project which will aim to, uh, as I said, ensure sustainable development, to make sure that people have a reason to stay there, that they believe in their future, and they can actually make Artsakh stronger. And I want you to understand that without you, uh, it is impossible, because you are part of that too. Our strength in, is in fact in you as well, because without you, we couldn't have managed, like we didn't manage Back then, when we were having the dark days of war, we needed your help. Now we need your help in actually being with us, advocating our rights, trying to raise awareness about Artsakh in your respective countries, in the US, in other parts of the world. Uh, education. Of course, there are still many philanthropic projects going on. There are more than 100 schools and kindergartens that have been renovated or rebuilt from zero uh, by different um, benefactors, by different fundraising organizations. However, having done this, we have to ensure sustainability in this sector. And this could involve um, raising the quality of education in Artsakh, bringing trainers to train the local staff. Because as I said, when you live in a closed society and you don't really have much ties with outside world, your mentality is also becoming close. And we really need that fresh ideas and fresh workforce, if I could put it that way, from outside. And we know that in the diaspora we have so many renowned professors, teachers, doctors who can come and contribute their time. Sometimes it's actually investing your time into Artsakh's future. It's not always about money. It's about interests to actually be part of that big pan-Armenian issue so that it has a future and not only past. So in this direction, I think we could invite uh, people from diaspora to come and teach at Artsakh State University or even teach teachers to use new methodology that is being used um, um, here in other countries because our teachers don't usually get a chance to get retrained because neither UNESCO nor other organizations are really um, involved in Artsakh because, as I said, we're not recognized, hence our professionals don't get this professional health needed, uh, help needed. In the health sector, and when I say this, that doesn't mean that there are already many projects that are ongoing. For example, um, only a week ago when Amasya was telling about uh, congressmen and congresswomen visiting Artsakh, on that very day we had uh, doctors from California, from three different institutions, um, the Glendale Adventist, the Chevy Chase Hospital, and the Fresno group of doctors who came there to do three things. First of all, it had actually three components. Philanthropic one, because they came to actually also donate equipment that they were using. They came to train the local doctors to actually do their job better. And they actually conducted surgical operations on people who could not afford to do it elsewhere or otherwise. So in this one act, we get the combination of three things philanthropy, voluntary, voluntarism, and also uh, professional quality um, upgrades that changes, changes people's lives, the lives of actual people. It makes a qualitative change into the society. Uh, another example could be, for example, the, in the educational sector, so that you can understand how it happens. We have um, an institution called uh, Yeznik Mozian College in Shushi that was 
um, built by the French um, Armenians. And to this very day, we didn't really have too many specialists when it came to different specialties in construction, like plumbers and people like that. And this, you know, this college actually now uh, fits into the demand of the country because the graduates are uh, very well in demands. They don't have any problem finding jobs. And some of them actually do part-time jobs while studying. Uh, the establishing a Paul Eluard Center of Francophonie in Artsakh is another example, helping the education system, uh, developing Francophonie, uh, French-speaking, French language in Artsakh, because we have so many uh, sister-city relationships in France, and there are so many contacts that we really need it. And what they do, they actually do professional French language classes for doctors, for diplomats, for various sectors of life, so that Artsakh can actually cooperate uh, full-fledgedly with all these uh, organizations. Or um, the American Universities Extension Program funded by AGBU is another example of such a good wish because there are so many people that actually can learn English for free because if you're a country wanting to be recognized, you can't afford not to speak English. You really have to speak it to be able to communicate at various levels. And that is what they're doing now, trying to get Artsakh use, and not only use, but again, this is professional courses for scholars, for doctors, for teachers, not teachers of English only, but actually for teachers of different, so that they can actually exchange professionally with outside world. Uh, there are many such examples, actually. There are examples whereby we can turn to diaspora for an advice, for correction of some sort, for example, we have a long-standing relationship now with the Armenian Bar Association of America, and we are actually in touch with them regularly. And they do not only edit our legal documents when we need to do it, like recently we published a report on international uh, covenant on civil and political rights, and we were really blessed to have them to look it through from legal as well as from the uh, native language point of view, if I, if I could put it that way. Um, and that's not it only. I mean, there are many projects that we do that, that I cannot speak about right now in order not to harm those things happening. But um, our Tufenkian Foundation. Again, with them we have projects that they have helped to publish this report, for example, so that we can actually disseminate it in the think tanks and make it more known to the outside world. And not only that, there are things that we do that, again, I cannot really talk openly about, but it is a great help that we receive from them. Uh, the Human Rights Defenders Office, of course, is cooperating with them as well. We're having university to university contacts, again, uh, with the help of diaspora organizations in different countries. These are different actors, but mostly, actually, I have to say that this is thanks to ANCA as well. Especially, we have good cooperation with ANC Europe, because with them, we do a lot of political work in the European Parliament um, and different stakeholders by inviting them to Artsakh and showing what is Artsakh in reality so that they do not get um, to believe to other lies. Because seeing once is better than not really knowing what you're talking about. Um, what other aspects we have? Tourism could be another aspect. If every single Armenian could visit Artsakh only once, that could only already be a horrific um, impulse to the development of tourism, because every year the number of tourists is growing, and we try to organize different sorts of events like CONIFA, uh, football competition, or Pan-Armenian Games this year was held in Artsakh, part of it was held. And of course, the number of tourists has grown to that, thanks to that as well. But also media interest has grown immensely thanks to these events as well. So these are the things that we can actually work together and direct it in, in the way that they're more targeted and more result-oriented. Um, what is important about all of this is to actually work closely, and I have to say that we in Artsakh have a lot of housework to do as well in this direction. Why do I say that? Because from the same experience, like last year when I was at USC, 
we had this um, internship possibility for someone from the mayor's office of Artsakh to come and work in the city council of Los Angeles. Uh, Paul Kirkonian and USC have actually jointly created this possibility. But guess what? I returned to Artsakh. We tried to find someone, a single person in the mayor's office who speaks English. No way. We couldn't find anyone. We tried emergency services. We called about six ministries, but we couldn't really find anyone to... At the end, they said, okay, maybe someone from foreign ministry. We said, okay, we, we get more chances, like internship in the European office of Haidat and places like that, but let's make others participate. So we suggested tourism ministry, and there were a few people there, and one of them got selected and is now doing internship in L.A. as I speak here. So these are the things that we also have to do our home task to be able to uh, reciprocate this project, to be a reliable partner in what we want to do together. It is very important that when we look at Artsakh, we don't look at Artsakh um, in an elective way, if I can put it that way. We can't really be elective when it comes to um, working for Artsakh or in Artsakh, because it's about survival, and it is a must. We don't really have many choices. Otherwise, and I want to remember by summing up that from, it was Garagi Nezdeh that noted the importance of the Lerna in Hayastan for the security of the whole Hayastan. And it was then Monte who said, and I'm quoting, that if we lose Artsakh, we'll close the last page of our history. So what I want us to do, I want us not to allow us to close that page, but also but do everything possible so that we can actually have next pages of Artsakh together. And the fact that you're sitting here, I, I believe that every individual is interested in doing something. And usually it's not about leadership arrangements only that help. It's actually about people. It's one individual meeting another individual and a spark comes out of it and the project is born. And there are so many examples of this. Like we have Amasya here who is sitting very modestly, but his introduction to Artsakh started with an internship. He came as a volunteer with Armenian Volunteer Corps, uh, worked at the foreign ministry for a month, uh, translated the whole website, which was this thick, of the National Assembly page, the first National Assembly web page, and sometime later we discovered that Amasya is working at Hello Trust in Artsakh. So this is one person's involvement that brought about a qualitative change to the lives of so many. And this could be an example for everyone to follow. Um, Artsakh could be a place where you can realize your dreams. And we all will only win from that. That much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Armina, for that second introduction. <laughs> um, I, before I dig too far in, into Gharabal, uh I just want to talk a little bit about what the Halo Trust is, um, for those who may not know uh, much about it. Um, we are the world's first and still the biggest humanitarian landmine clearance organization. Um, we are headquartered in a tiny village in Scotland, but we work in more than 25 different countries around the world, including, of course, in Gharabakh. Um, our mission is to help communities rebuild, to help families rebuild their lives after conflict, to return to their homes and get on with their lives and their livelihoods in safety. And to that end, we recruit and train uh, people, men and women, from the communities that we actually work in. Right now, we employ nearly 9,000 people around the world. Um, and 99% of these people are from the communities themselves. They're the ones doing the work of, of clearing, clearing the minefields. Um, 
why do I have a picture of Princess Diana up here? Um, it's not because she is 164th Armenian, which is your bit of Armenian trivia for, for, for the day, if you haven't had enough yet. Uh, no, I, you know, I know that many people have not necessarily heard of Halo itself, but I find that a lot of folks remember quite vividly the images of Princess Diana walking through the minefields um, in 19, 1997, just a few months before she died. This was in Angola. It was a, it was a minefield that Halo was clearing at the time. Um, and for Princess Diana, this was one of her, her big causes, and she did a tremendous amount of work to bring landmines to the, to the world's attention and led to very practical steps to stop or at least reduce the production uh, of landmines and to speed up the clearance efforts around the world. The photo next to her, um, her son, uh, Prince Harry, who I guess is one 128th Armenian, uh, was taken just three weeks ago. He is standing in the exact same spot that Diana was 22 years ago, and you can see the transformation that, that took place. So he is literally following in her footsteps to, to continue bringing attention to this issue. And I, I, don't, I don't know if you follow the royal family, but let's pray that by the time baby Archie is all grown up, he can move on to, to doing something else at that point. Um, so you know, just by, by the nature of, of the work that we do, clearing landmines, clearing cluster munitions, we are working in some of the world's toughest places. And by toughest, I mean both in terms of security and politics. And we come into contact with some of the world's most, most isolated, most vulnerable communities. And a lot of the most vulnerable communities are the ones that are in countries that are not recognized or are only partially recognized. So you can see on the map, we work in some of these partially recognized places like Somaliland, Kosovo, Palestine, Abkhazia, and again, of course, Karabakh. Now, one thing, a couple of things sets Karabakh apart um, from all of these other places that I mentioned. Number one, most obviously, as we all know, is Karabakh is a much, much safer place than, than any of the other places that I mentioned, most of the countries you see on the map over there. Um, but, but, the, but, the, but the main difference that I want to highlight is that all these other places, despite their lack of recognition, still have quite a sizable international presence there, whether it's the United Nations, the European Union, the various big NGOs and charities around the world. They're working in Somaliland. They're working in Kosovo and Abkhazia. Gharabagh doesn't do these. Most of these institutions have never touched Gharabagh, have never set foot into Gharabagh. At the moment, in fact, there are only two international organizations, as in non-Armenian organizations, that are operating that have a permanent presence in Gharabagh. One is the Red Cross, which operates on both sides, of course, um, and the second is HALO, and that's it. At the same time, despite the extremely complicated political situation there, we are very fortunate that the United States government through USAID has always stuck by HALO and been the backbone of this program in Gharabagh. The NCA folks can, can tell you about this, this in much, much greater detail, but essentially in, in the late 90s, the Armenian American community mobilized and, and you know, expressed to their elected representatives that it is a priority for us that our government contribute to the peace process, contribute to stability and to help mitigate the humanitarian crisis that was in place at the time in Gharabagh. And for the first time in the late 90s or maybe 2000, uh, the U.S. Congress appropriated money directly for assistance to Gharabagh. And as part of that uh, was what brought HALO to, to Gharabagh. Since 2000, we've been the only agency doing humanitarian landmine clearance in Gharabagh. And we you know we've had various donors, um, private donors. The diaspora obviously has been extremely generous. But as Armenian Americans, we should be very proud and very grateful of what our government has achieved uh, in Gharabagh against really all odds. Um, and I think we can all recognize that, you know, although the U.S. government has been providing support all of these years, it has not been easy for them. And, and, and we have to recognize that this is done. Um, against all sorts of, 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 of pressure, um, but it is something that we should be proud of. And I think one message that we can take away both from, from Simon's and, and, and Armin's presentations was that when it comes to Gharabagh, nothing should be taken for granted. 
Um, you may you may have been following the news lately um, that the future of, of continued U.S. support for not just demining of Arabah, but for Arabah in general, um, is 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 up in the air. Um, um, so you know it, it is something that if it is a priority for us, if we're talking about foreign assistance to Arabah, not just from the U.S. but period, the U.S. is the only government that gives foreign aid to, to Arabah, and currently the only implementer of that foreign aid is the Halo Trust. So if we are talking about aid to Arabah. Um, and we're talking about support for demining. Those are one and the same thing at, 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 at the moment. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that, I think, when, when we have maybe time for Q&A. Um, I wanted to just show you a little bit about uh, of what we actually do in Rarabah. Um As you can see in the photo, this was, this was taken a couple of months ago at this, in the stadium in, in Stepanakert. Um, we have been one of the biggest employers in Rarabah for many years now. This was taken this summer, about 260 local men and women who we have trained and employed there. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, as our funding situation remains uncertain, uh, month by month, the number of people in this photo will decrease. But hopefully next year in the spring, we can bring back everyone that we have had to send home so far. I included this photo because I wanted to show you what a typical day in the office looks like for, for Halo Varabach. Um, this is a, a, one of our, our best deminers. Her name is Kristina Khachatarian. She is a mother of three, um, clear, clearing a, a minefield not too far from her home village. Um, and, you know, if, <laughs> if you've ever been to Varabach, you know that this is a very, very typical photo of what the terrain there looks like. Yes, we have actual minefields, but most of the minefields are not fields. They are mine mountains and mine for forests and, mi and mine gorges. So you can imagine what sort of effort it takes for human beings to go square meter by square meter to clear this land. It's painstaking, it's slow, it's expensive. What is she actually looking for in that photo? Um, I'm not going to go too much into the details of what landmines and cluster munitions and other things do to the human body, but I think it's important to recognize the threat that we're dealing with. And the, the top left is a very, very typical anti-personnel mine. One of those will, you know, take off your leg, and if you're a kid, it can easily kill you. To the right is one of our machines taking out an anti-tank mine. One of those can, in a second, wipe out an entire family. Both Armenian and Azerbaijani forces laid thousands and thousands of these devices during the war. And you know, the war ended officially 25 years ago, but these things are just as potent today as the day that they were laid. At the bottom half of the screen is a cluster munition, part of a cluster bomb. Um, this particular model we, uh, was one of the ones that, that we found and destroyed following the four-day war in 2016. Um, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, this was the first time that we had seen any kind of Israeli weaponry being used. It was, it was uh, fired by, by the Azerbaijani army in this case. Um, second, you can see that this is a particularly pernicious kind of device. The pink ribbon, extremely attractive um, for, a, for an unassuming child or even adult to, to walk by and, and pick up. This is what I like to call our Museum of Explosives. Um, this is from our, our main headquarters in, in Stepanakert, which all of you are, are, of course, always welcome to visit um, and see this stuff for yourself. But this is a sample of pretty much every kind of thing that we have recovered, that we have found and destroyed in Gharabakh. I think Simon mentioned in the, in the introduction that um, the landmines, the cluster munitions, all these things, we have found and destroyed over 70,000 of these devices in the last 20 years or so. You can imagine each one of those is capable of injuring or killing at least one person. And why, why is this work important? I mean, this is a, one of the, we all like to pull out facts about Armenia and Rarabakh. One of the ones that, you know, it's not as, as pleasant is that at one point, not too long ago, Rarabakh actually had the world's highest rate per capita of, of civilian accidents from these kinds of devices. So higher or at, at a par with places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. 
Um, like any sort of infographic, there's obviously stories behind what you see. Um, each, point, each point on this graph is a, is a human story or multiple human stories, many of them tragic. The spike that you see, you may notice that there's a big jump in, in 2004. Um, I just want to talk about that one a little bit because I think it really highlights the nature and the reality, uh, reality of the situation in, in Gharabagh. In 2004, the, pri the price of wheat globally jumped, spiked. People were so desperate to get on land and farm it that the number of accidents increased dramatically. But, as you can see, the trend is decreasing. We're not at zero yet, that is the goal, but we're getting there. And in order to do that, it really takes more than just going around blowing things up. It's very, very important to educate people. So something else that we do is called mine risk education, which involves going to every single school in Gharabagh. So no matter how small or how isolated the, the school is, it gets visited at least one time a year and as part of Gharabagh's national education curriculum, actually. And kids and adults um, are taught um, over and over again what to do if you see something, what not to do, who to call, who to contact. So the trend that you're seeing, that is a result of sustained clearance and sustained education. But as long as things are in the ground, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to get, this, get these numbers to, to zero. But we're doing our best. It's not all doom and gloom, as you see. Um, the impact of, of, of mine clearance um, is uh, in, in a place like Arabah has been transformative. Um, it was actually USAID, our, our main donor themselves, they did an assessment a few years ago, and they, and they think that over 80% of the entire population has been imp impacted one way or another by the work of mine clearance in, in Gharabagh. Um, as you can see, mine clearance, it opens up land. Thousands and thousands of acres of land have been returned to people to use for farming, um, for hunting, for foraging, all sorts of subsistence activities uh, in, that the people rely on in, in Gharabagh. Um, irrigation, um, roads, access, all sorts of things. Uh, one of the questions that we get asked a, a lot is, you know, why don't you just fence off the minefields? People know where they are. Why don't you just stick a sign and just, and just let it be? Why are you wasting all this time? Um, the truth is, people know where the mines are and they still go. That is a risk that, it's not that people are willing to take the risk. A lot of people have no choice or over the matter of years, they've just gotten too used to having mines in the ground, which is really, really dangerous. So that is the pressure, the time pressure to do this quicker rather than over a long period of time. Besides just that also, you know, we're, a lot of the things that, that, that you see in Gharabagh that are key parts of, of tourism and of Armenian heritage in Gharabagh were cleared um, in the early years. So this is Gansasar Monastery, the crown jewel uh, of Gharabagh, one could say. That's our, that's our guys, clearing it of explosives. Um, Amaras Monastery, the cradle of, of Christianity and the Armenian language in Gharabagh, was also cleared of landmines in the early years. Dikranakert, uh, key tourism site today. We cleared around it not too long ago. And a lot of these places that you go or you drive around, you know, it's like clearance that was done years ago, and wherever we do clearance, we, like, we, we put up a sign that says this area was cleared by Halo, um, but you know, over the course of years, these signs, they fade away, they disappear, you know, this one thing happens or another. This used to annoy me a lot, because I, I thought, you know, we're not getting credit for, for what we've done, but the more I thought about it, I think, good. If you're driving around Gharabagh, if you're growing up in Gharabagh, and you have no idea that all this, all this farmland these monasteries were once the site of minefields. That's honestly for the best. And hopefully this next generation can fully feel that way. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much, Amasya, and thank you, Armina.
Now, even though we started a little late, we are going to try to finish on time. And even though I have at least three questions to ask, I believe in direct democracy. So we're going to allow for questions to be asked. But don't ask stupid questions. <laughs> um, first question. <laughs> I'm going to oblige Becky by asking a stupid question. Um, this is possibly a weird question. These are all mine related. Uh, is there any clearance going on by Halo on the Azuri side of things? No, those are actually very, very, very common, not stupid questions. Um, uh, as far as us working in Azerbaijan, no, no, we do not. Um, we are, we're, we're a neutral international organization. Um, we work wherever we are invited to work and wherever it's safe for us to work. Um, so we work in Karabakh, but we've never been uh, requested to work, work in Azerbaijan. Um, but, you know, it, it's one of those, it's a, every human being has the right to live without the fear of explosives. What we do in Karabakh is no different from what we do in Zimbabwe or what we do in Cambodia. And we would do the same thing in Azerbaijan if we had the opportunity to do. Um, and second question about the maps. Uh, you're, you're assuming that there were maps in the first place. Uh, mo most, most of the, the mine laying that was done during the 90s um, was not done systematically. Um, it was, you know, one village had one case of mines, another village had two cases, and everyone kind of did what they could. And many of the positions in the villages were exchanged hands so many times that it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. So it, it, make, it makes our, our, our work certainly more difficult um, um, as a result. So unfortunately, we, don't, we generally don't have that information. If I may just add, in Azerbaijan, they actually train their own deminers. So they don't ask people to come, but they finance it from their budget, and they do the mining themselves. Thank you very much. We have a question there. Yeah, uh, first, thank you for all this presentation. It's been great. Um, this could be directed to you, Simon. Full disclosure, he's a friend of mine, but um, your work. Full, full disclosure, he's General Terrell's grandson. That's not important. <laughs> um, your works, I, I really respect your work. And I'm living in the southern, southern part of the United States. The evangelical Christian community is fairly strong and powerful, and this is a grassroots conference. What's being done to translate that information to those people? Those people have lists. They, have, they, they call their congressmen. The political consultants in, that, in, that, in the, that community mail those people. This is information that those people would get worked up about for the simple fact of Christian monuments being destroyed by Muslims will irritate the heck out of them. Thank you for the question, uh, Phil. And um, I think the, I guess the general question is if there's a path to accountability for Azerbaijan's actions and how we can engage a variety of communities, not just Armenian ones. Well, and one to, path, succeed, to, succeed, to succeed, we're going to have to go outside the Armenian community. So, and, and I'll get to it. So, thank you. So, one path that I have identified is for the uh, UN Security Council to initiate a resolution that would refer this destruction to the International Criminal Court. There are two precedents for this for such resolutions, since Azerbaijan is not a member state. And there's also an ICC precedent of, um, uh, of uh, cultural destruction being prosecuted as crimes against humanity and war crimes. So to get to that point, we could ask members of Congress to put pressure on our UN ambassador uh, to initiate such a resolution, and evangelical and other communities can be part of, you know, that, that pressure point. To get those people off, you're going to have to get to, to get to their communities. You're, like in Houston, Texas, we have an Azerbaijani center. We're, I'm, in, I'm in a place where there are a lot of religious conservatives. I mean, if you get that information out to them, you don't think they're going to be going crazy protesting at the Azerbaijani center? You guys are crazy if you don't think that's going to happen. All right. Thank you. All right, quick question, yes. Yeah, um, do you be, this, is, this is for the um, both, both people. One is for the landmine clearance. How much landmines are there left to clear? And for the, for the, the, the person who comes from um, Artsakh, 
Um, nice to meet you. Um, I'd like to um, ask, what about the Green New Deal? You said you export a lot of energy. Do you export gr green energy? And with the Green Green New Deal as in U.S. Congress, do you think you work with U.S. Congress to help wean us off of fossil fuels and, and weaken Azerbaijan's stance in the region? All right, thank you. Amasya? Yeah, so uh, at, uh, what we're doing currently in, in Gharabagh is a process of, of national survey, and this is done in every country in the world that is contaminated with landmines, is where we go village by village. The local people are, are always the ones who have the best source of information because they're the ones who um, often participated in the war. Some of them even laid the mines themselves. Um, unfortunately, they're the ones who suffer accidents or their animals suffer accidents. So we go village by village and we are in the process of, of making sure that we know um, the extent of mine contamination in, in the country, what we know and what we don't know. Um, so hopefully soon I can be able to give you an answer, but at the moment we're in the process of figuring that out. Thank you, Armin. Thank you for your question. I hope I understood it correctly. But um, we have hydroelectrical um, power stations that basically the energy we receive is a renewable energy, as we call it. But today government is also boosting um, the development of solar panel energy, trying because, as you know, hydroelectrical power stations use the water rivers in order not to really damage the ecosystem in the long run, we're looking for alter alternatives in this system. As to the issue of whether Congress will be able to help or not, uh, recently we had Congressman Pallon, who had said that he's actually on the committee that deals with renewable energy, health, and um, IT. So we made sure that he actually visits the hospital, meets the doctors, the Glendale doctors who were working there at the time, also gets to know the uh, existing possibilities of the hospital, explain to him the possibilities of the um, solar energy introduction to Artsakh because we're already working with some Armenian companies trying to see how we can actually emerge that into Artsakh. And IT sector is one sector that I have to confess I have forgotten to mention, but it's actually the most, uh, a, a sector with the most potential because it doesn't really require transportation or anything. IT is a sphere that, and TUMO is a good example um, set, because we have a TUMO center in Stepanakir that where most of the children aged 12 plus are attending and trying to actually develop that sector as well. Because if we want our generations to be competitive, we have to make sure that actually we have good IT specialists. Thank you. So we have 41 seconds left, and I'm going to allow the lady here to ask the last question. Thank you. Oh, me? Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Ali Kbedikian, and I have a question for you, Armine. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful that you're here and you're able to speak to us. It's very inspiring to, um, you know, just, just hear how much, how open uh, Gharabagh is and Artsakh is to receiving help. I guess my question, um, it seems like there are a lot of stereotypes when I, you know, we try to reach out and go and do humanitarian work. Um, we get a lot of pushback, um, negative feedback coming from just lay people, right, that um, they're not so open to receiving help because they're so, you know, habituated in their own patterns of living. So I guess it's not so much of, I guess it is a question, but how can we inspire or open those doors to um, include the diaspora more as far as providing that humanitarian work? How can we break those barriers? Well, stereotypes are dangerous things, and I think they exist everywhere. But um, I guess this uh, negative stereotyping from humanitarian aid came from the fact that they actually kind of, it makes people lazy, if we can put it that way, in some way or another. But it's a general concept that is not applicable to all cases. And there are indeed spheres that where humanitarian aid is needed. And um, it's just a matter of working closely with the social welfare ministry, or if you cannot reach out to them, we are all with the foreign ministry, is there to bridge up 
diaspora organizations. We have a diaspora uh, department, not diaspora ministry or high commissioner for diaspora yet, but we have a department that actually coordinates the contacts with the diaspora and puts them in contact with health ministry, social welfare, who are able to give more professional and relevant information to people who want to work there, and also guide them through the processes and procedures of doing it correctly. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Please help me thank Amasya and Armine for being here today.